Hi everyone, I'm Valentin Schneider. I work for Red Hat and I'm going to be talking about IPIs and what to do when you don't really want them to hit certain CPUs. So the nice thing is uh, Leonardo kind of touched on it, uh, at least for the, the context I'm interested in, which is CPU isolation, no it's full, as you know, callback, uh, the whole shagang. And the idea is you have a single user space task on one of those isolated CPUs and it doesn't really want to enter the kernel, at least not voluntarily. So it could be your vCPU thread, it could be DPDK style um, packet processing. Really it's full user space and as long as it doesn't get interrupted, it's gonna stay in user space. Uh, now, unfortunately, when you look at that, you can still end up getting IPIs sent to the CPUs, and that comes from work that's happening on the housekeeping CPUs. So we have, in a way, uh, an isolation break. And the two I'm interested in are, first of all, for x86, when you patch kernel instructions, you end up sending IPIs to do a synchronization for that. So SATI keys, for instance, are gonna be the main culprit here. And also when you do a TLB flush for addresses in the kernel range, you can end up sending IPIs to these CPUs. Now if you look at these two, you can actually start reasoning that they only really concern the kernel. Static keys are instructions that are only in the kernel, and if you're flushing the TLB for the kernel range, as long as you're in user space, that doesn't really concern you. So the logic, or the ID is, can't we actually wait until the task enters the, the kernel for some, some other reason and then do this work? Because it's not urgent to do that immediately if the task is in user space. That's pretty much the ID behind uh, IPI deferral. Now, it's not a new topic. Uh, I've talked about this at OSPM, at that LPC, and so there's been a few little bits of work that have been accomplished on the way there. First of all, to, just to figure out what IPIs are we getting and where they come from, because until relatively recently, we didn't have anything. We had some IPI trace point, but it was R specific for ARM64 and ARM, and it just told you, hey, you've got an IPI. It didn't tell you what really it was or where did it come from. Uh, so we have um, trace points for that now. Uh, and we can also um, filter a bit more cleverly um, with F-Trace. So we couldn't actually use um, like CPU mask intersection uh, for F-Trace filters, which is something that's really useful when you do it to say, hey, I know my uh, CPU mask, my isolated set, and I just want events that target these CPUs. Because then with the level invocation there, anything that you have in the resulting trace is interference. You don't have to do post-processing, you know, if there is something in the trace, that's something you have to look at. Actually, if you replace Hackbench there with LTVAL that John talked about, that's how I found out about the two uh, IPS I'm talking about. Now into the meat of the subject. Um, there is some complications with deferring IPIs. So here, there's probably a bit too much detail on um, textbook, so that's what you get when you're updating static keys or really any instruction. I'm just gonna keep saying static keys because it's faster than kernel instruction patching. Um, but right now upstream, when you update your text, you're gonna end up sending IPIs to a lot of CPUs and then at the end of all of that, synchronously, you're gonna get the completion back and then you go on and carry on with your life. If you start deferring that, so you would go okay, I'm, I'm updating text, uh, let's go through all the CPUs I need to send IPIs to. Oh, actually, this one is in user space, I don't need to interrupt it immediately. I'm just gonna automatically set something somewhere and it, I get in, in return the promise that as soon as possible, when that CPU enters kernel, the, the kernel, it's gonna execute this callback. The devil is in the details, it's in what exactly is as soon as possible. So. You can see here, for the lack of better naming, I've called that the danger zone, between actually entering the kernel and going through context tracking and realizing, oh, actually, I, had to, I have to run this deferred operation, let's run it now. You haven't run the operation. So if you reason about static keys, which I think actually is my next slide, uh, if in this region, I'm gonna go back, you have a static key that was modified previously, you haven't run your synchronization operation, and you're screwed. Like, 
it's not really a nice place to be. Thankfully, at least for static keys, um, maybe I should talk about other stuff, because yes, it's uh, instruction patching, so you can also have any sort of probes, so uh, K probes, BPF. Thankfully, we prevent that from happening in early entry uh, code because it's all new instrumentation. So that gets rid of all of those probes. You can still have static keys, but with a little nifty thing called Optool, we can actually look at the uh, objects that we generate, and we can see, oh, in those new instrumentation regions, which I'm kind of abusing, I'm using it as that means early entry, but that's good enough for me, are there static keys that are being accessed? And then I can generate a warning at compile time to say, hey, you need to look at that because it's a bit risky. And actually, yes, they were quite a lot, but they weren't really a problem because they were static keys that are set um, at init, and then they stay the same forever at runtime. So we have a little annotation for that, which is read only after init, so slap that on these, and then the warning goes away. There are two static keys that are still problematic, and I can't really reason about changing them. Uh, one is yay mitigations, um, MDSI don't clear, which gets modified whenever we do SMT hot plug, because as I understand, that only needs, like the operation or the mitigation for MDS only needs to happen when you have SMT. So if you end up in a state where you've hot plugged all of your hyper threads out, then we disable this, so we don't have the cost of the mitigation anymore. Uh, and the other one is for the TSC, which I really know not a lot about, but as I understand, pretty much any time at runtime, it can be marked as unstable, uh, for instance, if you load the KVM module, and that ends up flipping the static key, and then you're screwed because that's in early entry code. You wanna say something, Steve? I think I was just gonna say I agree with that last point. Yeah, so uh, the question here is, <laughs> can we just leave them as they are? Because um, MDS are clear, that means you have SMT hot plug. If you're doing hot plug, eventually you're gonna get a C, uh, uh, actually, stop machine, me, so. No, I was saying, can we just annotate like that function or something like that to say that, um, uh, that we are okay with getting the IP anyway, because. Yeah, but the question is how can we, um, or can that can those two functions actually check that an API was done? So basically, um, and you know, how, can it be? When, I mean, there, you said they're in no instrument. Yeah. Well, then, wouldn't if you modify it, wouldn't that fail the no instrument? Because so. you're not supposed to be able to modify a no instrument function. Or so code. yeah. So no, uh, with optional, I'm not modifying anything. I'm just uh, catching the cases and warning about it at compile time. So there's no modification. It's just about getting warnings. No. Oh. Because I'm wondering, like, because I thought there's going to be a time where you won't be able to do modification. I mean, that means. Oh, you mean like the static key itself? Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. There, there. So. Yeah, so that's something I think we should report. I had, have you reported to Peter? Uh, about these, I think at some point uh, on IC, but I haven't made like a formal yeah. report. Okay. So, but I, I like, yeah, I think the the reasoning I was going for with the first one is you're going through hot plug, so you're screwing over your latency anyway, yeah, so yeah. Well, yeah. you lose. And uh, TSC, I don't really know much about, but if you're doing something that marks it as unstable, is it reasonable to say, well, same, screw you? No, oh. doesn't work. Wait, 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 wait. Problem solved. Yeah, but usually that's the only time I've ever seen that triggered is always on boot. Okay. I've never really seen uh, it. Uh, when I looked at the yeah. functions, there's mostly yeah, init functions, but there are some that aren't marked yes. init functions, like loading KVM module. So. Yeah. yeah, so it's like the mark, well, I'm saying the mark TSC unstable. I mean, like I said, I've only seen that trigger like on a boot. Like, yeah. It's cool. usually detected early on. Uh, well, maybe sometimes if the, there are like um, uh, tasks like always running starving, and maybe there is some check going on, and the check freaks out. Mm. And, but so there is something yeah, okay, not working yeah. correctly on the system anyway. Yeah. Okay, but yeah, so I think the um, the outcome for that would be modify these static keys to give them like a special annotation so that Optool says, yeah, okay, I know these are in this region, but we are okay with getting the cost anyway because it's not going to be the worst of the latency anyway. Okay, cool. Uh, the other one is a um, bit more tricky. So if we defer TLB flushes for the kind of range, now the problem is, okay, what if we access something Oh yeah, okay, I put VMAP here because I'm only doing this for um, VM alloc. Um, what if we access something that should have been affected by a TLB flush in this early entry uh, code? Um, one of the things that was raised by Nicholas was uh, if you have a VMAP stack, 
But as far as I can tell, that's not a problem because only yourself can really touch that, and that's going to be, well, when the task is initialized and then when it dies. There shouldn't be, as far as I'm aware, uh, any missing about with this in the lifetime of a task. Uh, one thing I'd like to get ideas on is, is there any way to generate a warning or s figure out if in no instrumentation regions we are accessing VMAP addresses? Hmm. Because then that would be the equivalent of, oh, I'm catching that, I'm accessing a static key. I'm well, no, I'm just, the two people that I know that could answer that question are not here. <laughs> it's like, that's, that's, that's what I'm that's thinking. Peter about. Like, is there and, a natural yeah. validation that that's the case? That's right, right. my question. Uh, what's it called? Mark Rutland would be another one because he does a lot with the no instrument <laughs> code. But, but isn't this the case when you address the stack in no instruction? Was it? Uh, in no instruction um, phase and you touch the stack, then it is well mapped, right? Or do I misunderstand uh, the question? Oh, no, 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 no. Um, the, the, ma uh, the, the, the map, the stack is like, uh, it's not VM mapped. You have an option to have it. It is. Yeah, like, yeah, oh, no, yeah. Wait. Oh, uh, oh, It's actually the default on x86. Oh, it's, uh, oh, that's right, it made it. But the problem, yes. the problem is not if it's uh, VMAP, the problem is if it would have been affected by your flush when you're entering this. Right, right. And so as far as I can tell, the stack mm -hmm. cannot. Right, that, so basically, okay, I see what you're saying. So basically the problem is if it's VM mapped, it just, that means that, the question is, could this memory be pointed to something else now? You could reuse it. No, no, if, no, I'm saying is, could this, because VM map is, because it goes to the page tables yes, and you yes. could put it here, uh, and the flush will say, okay, now put it here, and that's where the error will happen. So the question is, like, the stack doesn't change. Once you VM map it, you're not going to say, oh, let's give this thread a, different task a maybe, new. But not the same that's current yeah, the that's, same task. Yeah. That's, what we, that's what I'm saying. When it comes into the kernel, it's going to look at the stack. So I don't think, that's, I don't think the stack would be an issue. I don't think of anything else that would be touching. But, uh, so the thing is, well, like, I don't know. So even, would there be a way to find this out, figure oh. this out? Or? So basically, wait, to say if you're in no instrument code and if you do a VM map. I like, at least like even just experimentally so that I can yeah. have an idea of is there something else because I can look at code, but yeah, this. Um, the VM, or say the no instrument uh, sections are marked, correct? Yeah. So you could find it. So why don't we just put a trace point in that go, or put, have hook something into the trace point for the faults, or is it any faults? Like, it would be, or you're only worried if it's a fault, right? Uh, well, you're not always, are you guaranteed to always get if, a fault? If you, well, if you change it, wouldn't it the only way, well, will it automatically fault then if it comes back or would it, would it require a fault? Or do you I have no idea. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> what, uh, that's like a, what, do a perf thing is the CLP flush or no? Um, a cat, well, we could do a cache miss, you could do, I'm trying to think, so how do you know if something's, that could be mapped, but the question is you could, if it's, you're saying you're telling a map, but you're saying if it ever changed. I mean, as a start, even if I just get something that's yeah, mapped, and then I can have a look at it, see well, how bad the Yeah, the when everything you get to see a map, or is there a way to know when something got remapped? So if every time you look at something that got remapped or unmapped, either unmapped or whatever, mm -hmm. check to see if that came from a no instrument or instrument function, and that, that might be able to tell you. Yeah, I could do something with tracing on that. Ah, yeah. But what? you unmap, uh, you reuse the address, you have a different task. This one gets uh, scheduled on a CPU that is, um, didn't have the TLD flash. Wait, wait. So, you, so, you sway, so basically, wait, you. Uh, you free a task, it gets yes. unmet, then it gets reused again for another task. This task gets scheduled on that CPU. And that goes yeah, but I think it only works because then it's basically, but the same, that they, it's the address. So it'd be, if that's a, a task going away, a task, well, a task coming in, it will have the, it's a question is would the task have the, or would the address be the old in it's, the CLB? That's the question, but theoretically it's going to happen. But, okay, but freed and got back, I'm trying, okay, so I well, guess if the question you, is, like in this scenario, at you, least, yeah. I know, are you talking about the stack or any other? On the stack, yes. For the so, stack, no, because that task, can't free, like, can't go through exit and free its stack until it has re-entered the kernel. Right. No, no, I think what, the, what they're saying is... The problem is, is only in the early entry. Ah, okay. Yeah. It's, oh, yeah. it's the, the danger zone. Yeah, like, wait, wait, it has, yeah, it has, so, to, be in the, it has okay. to be in user space. Because the problem is yeah. only this. Yeah. After, once it's in the kernel and through context yeah. tracking, I don't yeah. care anymore. Yeah, so, ah, okay. was there a okay. question? Any else? I don't know. 
Okay, yeah, thank you. And uh, another thing which I was not aware of but was raised in the last thread by Nadav and Dave, which is apparently x86 can do this thing where it's free to cache the uh, paging hierarchy at any time and kind of access it or access whatever it has cached at any time. And so the worry was if uh, we unmap something and we end up freeing uh, an intermediate or like a page table page and then we uh, resume, like enter the kernel on one of those isolated CPUs, then you could have something where the CPU still accesses this intermediate page that was freed and then it explodes. But uh, VNMAP actually doesn't free any of those intermediate pages, so we are okay for now, but I don't know if uh, people have more concerns or comments on that, because yeah, that's something I was really not aware of and people had to point it out to me. And then it's fun. And yeah, if there's uh, no comments or questions, that's my last slide. Anyone have any comments or anything? I'm trying to think, so for, uh, and this is just basically to say you don't have the deferred IPIs, because um, that's something that we do actually want, I know we definitely want. Um, Actually, maybe I can add on uh, something uh, there was talk about uh, for power management as well. Uh, at the top of my patches, I have well, an option to also do that for like if you have an idle CPU. It's kind of reasoning yeah, yeah. the same, but if it's running in user space, you don't yeah. have to send the API, so you can stay in the deep idle state. And yeah. yeah, that's right. That you want to have to, um, yeah, so idle CPUs for power, yeah, so you want to wake it up. Similar yeah. reasoning, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how many IPIs do you have that bother you? How many got you rid of, and how many are in unknown state? Um, you mean in terms of like different callbacks or like? Yes, and let's say you have this IPI and this is like easy PC, I got rid of it, so this, this one deferred works. So uh, in this implementation, so I have these two with the instruction patching and um, the TLB flush, and I can't remember in the initial implementation by Nicholas and Peter, I think they had five, but I can't remember what they were. Okay. So, um, the only time we care about that is for no hertz full. Yes. RT would work. No, I'm saying, but we, uh, the only time you, only time this would be work, useful is no hertz full because that's the only time we stop well, the tick. Well, if we do we the, <laughs> if we do the idle thing, then it uh, would be like regular no hertz, not no hertz full. Well, uh, no, but I'm saying if, i yeah, for but the only time we care about the incoming into from from user space to kernel mm -hmm. is for no hertz full. Yeah, that's the only yeah, time yeah. because otherwise you're being interrupted by the tick anyway. So it's, we don't care about IPIs because you constantly get a tick. But, but I think so. This came from violating some very low threshold circuit test. I think so. I think if you receive an IPI right after you're servicing your time, so it can I think still make a it difference. It may need Yeah, but then if you have, if you don't, yeah, but then a tick could do cause the same thing to you, can't you? But the tick but, doesn't mind. The tick is something you can live with because you know when it's coming. Okay, IPIs, tick, I, so, you have no idea what's coming into. I mean, what we could do is bash IPI, like whoever's going to send the IPIs, bash it, say, well, we're going to wait for the tick to happen so they all happen at the same time. I don't know. <laughs> like, this, no. this gets spiked. But that's what I'm saying. It's mostly, but most of the time, if you care about the IPI, you're going to probably do, you don't probably going to care about the tick. I mean, yes, maybe certain things, workloads. Mm -hmm. The question is, are in a real world situation, if you, is there a case where, oh, the tick is okay, but I don't want the IPI? That's the question, is in the real world, is that a problem? Um, if not, otherwise we're just getting to a scenario, yeah, my cyclic test is a little bit longer with IPIs on. I think it depends on how many IPIs you get and how long. Yeah, and then of course, yeah, then you could, if you're controlled, then you kind of control the IPIs, because the IPIs only happen on usually user events mostly. Right. Um, so I was just thinking with uh, Frederick here. Um, so with, uh, uh, what's it called, no hertz full on, how early do we attach when we come into, well, like how early is it when we turn on the tick, when we come into the kernel? Is that, how, is that later on or is it immediate? In other words, but when we, so with no hertz full, yeah. uh, how early, like when you come back in, so you're user space and you have the tick yeah. turned off. And then when you come into user space, you're gonna to have to turn on the tick again. Where does that happen? Where does that happen? When does well, the tick start? Yeah, no, when does the tick start? When you restart, Steve, oh, man. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, it might never ever restart unless there is a grace. Well, you, it, it, it depends, really it depends. It might never even restart if there is no need to. It can stay in, uh, in, the, in, kernel, in the kernel without a tick. Uh, yeah. No, it's it's in there. The, I, I heard a click. So no, because RC is does RCU depend on the tick? So yeah, if you're coming to the or when do like I said, you need don't you need to start the tick for? Yeah, it, it, there is a grace period. Yeah, grace start. because I was wondering. And at some point, there might be a might my, be a need to restart. Because is there my question? My, exactly, my real question is: Is there a code to detect you just came in for to user space? Detect, the detect user yes. For you, maybe RCU. So I'm like, where, uh, I'm trying to look, think about where the problem would be for that user. So you already looked at every place where you could start the, uh, where you enable IPIs, right? So you know where, like, all the instrument, like, where you start. Um, where you could say it's, we're back from user space. That's the main right. thing. Right. It's uh, context tracking. So it's uh, when we're in right. the RCU stuff. Yeah. Or right. say RCU is watching again. It's the same place. Yeah. That's why I'm worried about. Um, my other thing was the no hertz side, we could do that now, basically. So we could use the no hertz code and just not send IPIs to no hertz and still send IPIs to user space. Then there's no problem with that. Do you maybe have a config for that if you're worried about power savings? Uh, at the top of the stack, yeah. I have a batch for that. Okay. But is it, oh, it's time? Final or question. Final question? Yes. It's actually just a very basic question for me, uh, it's because IPIs have been a, a theme in almost a lot of talks. Are IPIs also problematic just for the latency RT case, or even in the normal case, they can cause more trouble than they should be? Of course, they are done for a reason, but I'm just saying, is it an RT thing, or it's also I mean, normal? technically, if you're looking at uh, CPU resolution and no hot fall, you don't even need RT, because you're not even entering the kernel if you're staying in user space. Mm -hmm. So it's really just like generally more latency, like interference problem. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you.